webinar with Dr. Daniel Korkos. Thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna take just a minute or two here as people join the webinar. Okay, and I see the participant number ticking up, which means that it's working, fantastic. Maybe just another minute. Thank you everyone who's just joined for being patient. We're waiting just another minute as other folks log in today, today's webinar. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start. Um, for anyone who just joined, my name is Vic Maurer. I'll be your host for today's Northwestern Medical Alumni Association webinar with Dr. Daniel Korkos, uh, who is a professor of physical therapy and human movement sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. And before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded to be available for viewing after the program. If you have any questions for our presenter, please use the Q&A feature in this Zoom webinar. We will hold questions until the end of the session, and I will then read the questions out loud for Daniel to answer as time permits. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Daniel Korkos. Dr. Korkos leads the Laboratory for Therapeutic Interventions in Parkinson's Disease where his research focus is twofold. First, seeking to understand the causes and progression of Parkinson's disease. And second, finding treatments to help people with Parkinson's disease live their lives to the fullest. It's an honor to be joining you today, Daniel. Thank you for coming. And I thought that maybe a good way to get started would be to start with a short video. That's okay with you. Great. When I was first diagnosed, my doctor said, probably by the time you were 40, you would be in a wheelchair. Today, I'm 43 years old. There is not a wheelchair in sight. My name is Jimmy Choi, and I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's at the age of 27. I met Cheryl in high school, actually, so we were high school sweethearts. He was the jock. I was the nerd in high school. It was uh, two proms and one homecoming. And then we got married almost immediately after, after we graduated from college. My dad always said, when you get married, ready to start a family, you buy life insurance, protect your family. So that's what I did. And it was actually the nurse that came on and did my physical that noticed things about me that I had never even thought of before. I didn't want to believe that it was Parkinson's. I felt powerless because I didn't know what Parkinson's was. I took the medication and for the next eight years, my regimen never changed. I started gaining uh, quite a bit of weight, actually. I was about 240 to 250 pounds, and I was falling over quite a bit, so I had to walk with a cane. Everything became hard, so frustration was set in. My rock bottom moment really came when I was carrying my then 10-month-old son, Mason, down the stairs, and I lost my balance, and the two of us went tumbling down an entire flight of stairs. It was terrifying. Is this what I have become? A safety hazard to my family. Instead of, 
Nice job. Way to hustle out there. Huh? That fall made me think, what can I do to better my situation? There is no cure. It made me want to see what I can do to change that. There were clinical trials out there all over the place. So I figured, hey, that was going to be what I can do. A lot of the studies that have been done in, the, in recent years are around exercise. Uh, I first became interested in studying the effect of exercise on people with Parkinson's disease in about 2001. My area of scholarship is to look at how you activate a muscle when you make a movement. People with Parkinson's disease are weak, so a combination of being weaker and having abnormal muscle activation patterns led me to propose a research study to look at the effect of resistance exercise. Progressive resistance exercise dramatically reduces the signs of Parkinson's disease. And that's what we showed. The uh, exercise protocol that Jimmy has just been using, uh, the details were published in the New York Times last year. So people as a result, they were stronger, they were faster, their muscle activation patterns improved, and they were very happy. The more physical activity that I was doing, it was making me feel better. And I figured, you know what, if this is making me feel better, I'm going to do more of it. When I told Karina that I was going to be on American Ninja Warrior for the first time, I think she squealed louder than anything I've ever heard. She was certainly more excited than I was. For me, there was, it was panic. You know, what did I get myself into? So Northwestern Medicine Clinic came, came in to help. What does it mean for him to take on that challenge? And also, what does that mean for his medication and training? Today, compared to eight years ago, I'm about half of the medication that I used to take. It's not just halting the progression. It really is giving myself back a couple of years that I may have lost. So if you have Parkinson's disease, a lot of things go wrong. And so you need all kinds of specialists to help you. And major medical centers have access to that. Uh, they have terrific expertise and they can actually help with all aspects of the disease. When I think about my care team at Northwestern, I think about my friends. Because over the years, that really, that's what they have become. They accept my craziness in terms of trying to get to that next level. And I think that made a great relationship. Uh, people ask me all the time, you, you run you know, a marathon in three hours and 40 minutes, or you're able to compete on American Ninja Warrior for three years in a row. Can you imagine how much stronger you would be or how much faster you would be if you weren't diagnosed with Parkinson's? My response is very simple. If I was never diagnosed with Parkinson's, I wouldn't be doing these things. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that video. And without any further ado, I will turn it over to Daniel to, uh, to talk more about what does him right here. I would like to begin by thanking Vic, Catherine, Babette, Gillian, and also Margaret, who've been very helpful and without their immense amount of hard work, I wouldn't have the honor and privilege of being able to talk to you all today. And it really is an honor and privilege. I'm delighted to be able to talk to all the many alumni, alumna of Northwestern University. I've been here seven years and I've enjoyed and loved every minute. I also get emails and correspondence from people with Parkinson's disease from around the world. And so we have people today joining us from as far afield as the Netherlands. So welcome. So I'm gonna to talk to you about can exercise slow Parkinson's disease progression. Now, clearly not everybody is Jimmy. He's quite an exceptional person. But I do think that if all of us, whether we have a disease or not, do everything we can to look after ourselves, we can slow down the rate at which we either age or the progression of Parkinson's disease. Now, about 10 years ago, I went to NIH and I proposed my, uh, what was to be called now, Sparks 2 
the study you've just re uh, seen referred to in New York Times. And their program officer, Peter Gilbert, said, well, it's just exercise. Why do we need to study exercise? And at one level, this is a very good question, because if you look at the quote below, the Plato, the very wise man, said, lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being, while movement and methodical physical exercise save it and preserve it. So we've known for a long time that it's good for one. But Oscar Wilde is not alone. When he wrote in 1891, to get back my youth, I would do anything in the world except take exercise, get up early, or be respectable. And many people find exercise or exercising or allotting the time difficult. And the goal of my research is to provide such a compelling evidence base to physicians and physical therapists that when they talk to people who have a disease, that even if exercise has not been part of their life, even if they find it hard, and even if they struggle to get motivated, that the take home message is sufficiently compelling that they exercise. So at the conclusion of my presentation today, especially if you have the disease, and many of you do, you should know the performance, sorry, you should know the importance of performing progressive resistance exercise twice a week. But endurance training is valuable three times a week. And it's good to do balance training. And this is the basis of the exercise prescription that I will share with you at the end. And also to know that at every stage of the disease, the exercise is good for you. Clearly towards the end of the disease, it becomes harder and harder to do any activity. But still, one should try to do the best and the most that one can. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is the progression of disability in Parkinson's disease. On the y-axis here, we have degree of disability and here we have time. Prior to being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, people often experience REM sleep behavior disorder, depression, constipation. Very important paper recently on altered heart rate metrics that when you record the heart rate, it is different and there are parameters that are different. Anxiety, hyposmia. Then symptoms begin and at some point you will find a movement disorder specialist, hopefully, who will diagnose the disease based on bradykinesia, rigidity, rigidity, and sometimes tremor. And the important thing about Parkinson's disease, which is very well understood now, is that it's a motor disease, where you have reduced strength, reduced peak VO2, freezing of gait, you have fluctuations, dysphagia. But the non-motor symptoms are what can be most bothering to many people. So you have mild cognitive impairment, orthostatic hypertension, and as many as 80% of people can end up with dementia. And then if you look at blood derived biomarkers, there's an increase in C-reactive protein and a reduction in brain derived neurotrophic factor. This is the problem. So what is the solution? Well, by now you should know the solution. And here it is a combination of resistance, cardio, and balance exercises. So at the bottom of the pyramid, focused breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, meditation are important. Walking is remarkably good for one. I think I know there's one person watching and she walks her two miles every day and it's terrific form of exercise. And then you can go to mild intensity, but the evidence is accumulating that it's the high intensity rowing, cycling, running that may give one more bang for the buck. And that's the hard part to persuade oneself. Now, when I teach my doctor of physical therapy students, I ask them the question, how many of you are doing weight training? And about two thirds are and about one third are not. And so I tell them, look, if it's good enough for the squirrel, it should be good enough for you. And here's why. So the rationale for resistance training is really quite compelling. As we age, as we get disease, we get 
a decrease in brain volume and a decrease in cortical thickness. And resistance exercise increases this, which is good. White matter hypo intensities are not good and reverses it. You get an increase in small blood vessels. And at least in males with weight training, we increase levels of brain derived neurotrophic factor. So in 2013, I published a progressive resistance exercise trial. And my real interest was to show that people can exercise for a long time. And therefore, if people can exercise for two years, they can probably exercise for the rest of their life if they want to. And this was a two year study comparing progressive resistance exercise. This is weights designed to make you stronger and increasing the resistance. And at the end of 24 months, we had 20 people left. Fitness Counts is an exercise program, stretching, balance, but it's not progressive. At the end, we had 18 people left. Now, the most difficult part about running clinical trials for exercise is the control group, because we've reached the point that it is not ethical to assign people to a treatment arm that they do not get some kind of exercise. So what this data point shows, disease progression. This is on the UPDRS. Over two years, you progress about six points. Modified fitness counts, uh, six months did well, improved the UPDRS. This is a change from baseline score. So a negative five is good. Zero is, means you have no signs at all. But here we have the progressive resistance exercise group. And you can see at the end of 24 months, and Jimmy alluded to this in his video, this was not only slowing the progression part, Jimmy mentioned getting back two years. And this is kind of objective evidence for getting back two years. Now, for those of you with Parkinson's disease listening, I really want to stress the following. Individuals may vary in response. So the view right now of Parkinson's disease, it's either a syndrome or multiple diseases. So everybody is slightly different. And what this shows is that the fitness counts, one person got better by 12 points and somebody else actually over six months got worse by 20. Here is the mean change at the end of two years, which was zero. The progressive resistance exercise group improved by seven points, but you can see some did really well. So the next generation of research studies are going to try to probe individual responses. Why is it that some people do really well and other people perhaps don't do quite as well? Now, one of the things I want you to take home from this is that many people equate resistance exercise with muscle tone, bigger muscles. In other words, resistance exercise equals muscle. It does, but it's also the case that cognition improves. We don't know all of the underlying biological reasons, all the molecular changes that take place. But the progressive resistance exercise induces molecular changes. And what I want you to notice here, this is the digit span. How many digits can you remember? And at 12 months, the people are doing better. There was no difference between the groups, but they were doing better. This is the Stroop color word interference. This is a measure of how easily distractible you are. And this improved. And the brief test of attention is a measure of how well you pay attention. This paper was voted the best original research article for 2015 by the editorial board of movement disorders because neurologists recognize that it is the declining cognition, which really may be one of the hardest parts of the disease to treat. There are no medications and it may be the part which people find most frustrating. I work with a colleague in Brazil, Dr. Carla Batista Silva, and 
she has developed a form of resistance training where you bring in instability devices. So you can see an instability device here and here. You can see one here and here. It makes the exercise much harder. It means you can use smaller weights, but get pretty much the same change in strength. And her results are really quite impressive. So if we look here, this is a control group, no change. This is a resistance group, like my group. This was only 12 weeks, she got no change. Her, res her resistance training instability group dropped by about five points. But this is what is more remarkable. If you look at the individual Montreal cognitive assessment score, 25 is used as a kind of a cutoff to maybe suspect possible mild cognitive impairment. It's not a measure of mild cognitive impairment. That's much harder to diagnose and needs a much more comprehensive battery. But if you look here, all these people were below 25. They did her exercise intervention and they were above. So the take home message at this point is because it's the brain that activates the muscle, that working the brain is actually very good in terms of helping Parkinson's disease. Now, the next study needs to be done in Parkinson's disease. It hasn't yet been done, but it needs to be done. And this study shows that weight training increases the, poster the posterior cingulate thickness. So we're increasing the thickness of a part of the brain that's important for cognition, the posterior cingulate. And this was done in the dementia prodrome for mild cognitive impairment. These are people who possibly will get Alzheimer's. So the argument is being made currently that the earlier one intervenes, the better. If one waits till a person has dementia of Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, it's very hard to reverse it. But if we can slow the rate of decline, either they will get it a few years later or in the ideal world, not at all. And what I want you to notice, if you take computerized cognitive training and progressive resistance, you have this increase in cortical thickness. And so there's no mystery. I'm 67. And the last thing I want is for my cortex to become thin and most of my brain to be replaced with water. So resistance training is very attractive. And if you look here, this is progressive resistance training and a sham does better than the cognitive, the computerized cognitive training. And here we have a plot where we plot cortical thickness change. So this means that there's been an increase in cortical thickness. And here we have the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale of cognition. And so when the cortical thickness changes, cognition is improving. And that's a good thing. So here's the rationale for endurance exercise. It's quite compelling. And one of the things that exercise does, endurance exercise, it increases endogenous within the body, dopamine metabolism. And of course, Parkinson's disease it is, is a disease of decreased dopamine. So this is good. Improves blood vessel growth, neurogenesis, peak VO2 is very important, may improve, does improve walking economy. You get plastic changes, people with Parkinson's disease have elevated inflammation, which can be reduced. Mitochondrial function is improved, brain connectivity and neurotrophic factor. So you can see that if you could package this into a pill, everybody would be taking it. This would be the wonder pill. So I'm now gonna talk about the study in Parkinson's disease of exercise, the one referred to in the uh, video earlier. So the first purpose was to determine the feasibility and safety of high intensity endurance exercise. They were not known. So the idea was, is it safe and feasible for people to work out at 80 to 85% of their maximum heart rate? To let you know, this means you're on a treadmill and you can't have a conversation. This is working out hard. And then whether this affected the motor signs of Parkinson's disease had not yet been established. 
this is a very busy slide. It's called a consort diagram. I just want you to see here that the high intensity group had 43 to begin with, and we ended up with 38. So people lasted the six months. The moderate intensity, 45, had 42 at the end. And the usual care, this meant they continued to do what they normally did. We didn't deprive of them of exercise, the participants, that would not be correct. And we then offered them these one of these exercises after six months so that they would get any benefit from being in the study. We just delayed it six months so that we had a control group. The results were clear cut, published in JAMA Neurology 2018. People can work out at 80 to 85% of their maximum heart rate, and the 60 to 65% also worked out at their heart rate. If you notice here, the target was four days. They worked out on average about 3.2 days. There was no statistically significant difference between the 80 to 85% group and the 60 to 65% group. The 60 to 65% group did maybe exercise just a touch more, but there was no statistical difference. And what we learned from this is if you want people to exercise, for example, four days a week, you may need to prescribe it five. All of you, I'm sure, know that there's very often in any particular week, something comes up that makes one's exercise session difficult. And for those of you with grandchildren, you may just get a call which says, can you come and help? And you'd always put your grandchild before your exercise routine. And I think that's great. So the idea here is you build in for the fact that you're going to miss a session once in a while. Now, these are the data. So at six months, people progressed by 0.3 of a point. The disease was now progressing more slowly. The usual care progressed by four points or eight points over a year. And this is a big deal. Now, people in this study had not been medicated. They were very early in the disease, very early in the disease. Disease duration less than five years had not taken medication. The single most important part for me of science and what I talk about to my students and the people I train is replication. What I publish should be replicated. And if not, one can't move the field forward. So in 2019, I was really quite delighted when my good friends from Holland, Van der Kolk and colleagues, the last author here being a very famous neurologist by the name of Bastian Bloom, absolutely replicated the study. They studied people who are stage one and two between the ages of 30 and 75. They were sedentary. They were randomized to endurance exercise or active stretching. The intervention lasted six months. I have read through all the questions that came in. There were some wonderful questions that came in. We will address some of them uh, when I finish talking. I've also got a Zoom, which uh, Vic and colleagues have kindly set up in a week's time to take more individual questions. And what you should notice here, participants exercised on a stationary home trainer equipped with Exa Gaming software. So my good friend Bastian is quite convinced that it's not just kids and adolescents who like computer games, that you can find computer games for people of any age to motivate them to be on their bike. And their difference was exactly the same as mine. And then life got even more exciting. Margaret Mack from Hong Kong has just published a paper showing that brisk walking and balance exercise reduces the MDS UPTRS by six points. This is a big deal. And the difference between the control group was 4.6. So again, we have this change of about four points. So this is the third study to show it. Now this slide is a little complicated and I'm gonna walk you through it slowly because it's really important. So these are my data. We have baseline six months, the MBS, UPDRS part three, the motor score. And people progressed in one group. 
that was the usual care, and the other group stayed the same. There was no benefit in my study, just no progression, which is a different kind of benefit. This is the paper by my good friends in Holland. And you'll see you could move my plot up and it's identical to theirs. Again, they had no clear improvement per se, but the group exercising progressed at a slower rate. And you'll notice their people were more impaired by close to 10 points. And then there's the Mac study. And she showed the same difference between the two treatment arms, but in her case, these people got significantly better. And this has been giving me a lot of uh, thinking to do. So what is it about Dr. Mack's study that is so good, okay? Well, I think there are four things to remember, okay? One is, how severe your disease to be, is to begin with may impact how much of an improvement. In other words, if you only have a score of 20, your room for improvement is less. So how much you actually improve may depend on the severity of your disease. Risk walking was just that. This was not just a stroll. This was really brisk walking. The participants were exercising at close to 80% peak heart rate, the same as in the other two studies. It was a heart rate of 115 over 146. During the walking, there were times when for very short periods, the heart rate got as high as 146. So the heart rate did really increase in the MAC study. And the fourth point is really important. Um, exercise needs to be multimodal. So she had the balance component and she had people who had a balance problem. So if you go in and intervene for balance and change balance, you will get a better score. So what I want you to see is how, actually how important research is because we can systematically work through ways in which we can help delay the progression and perhaps also modify symptoms at the same time by understanding different kinds of treatment intervention and also how to pair them. It is an inevitable consequence of Parkinson's disease that a person will become posturally unstable. I'm a big fan of Tai Chi. I'm a big fan of all balance interventions. This paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. And their two primary outcome measures were how far you can reach forward and how well you can control different directions. And they compared it to a very gentle resistance program, not a vigorous resistance like my intervention, just gentle, mild exercise. You can see they have a 5.5% improvement and a 10.45% improvement that is statistically significant. So I hope at this point in the presentation, whether you have the disease or not, I have persuaded you that it is to your benefit and the benefit of your loved ones to do resistance training, endurance training, balance training. And this is quite consistent with every health guideline pretty much around the world. You can go to the CDC, you can go to NIH, you can go to National Health Service in England. The other thing which becomes really quite important and is getting very interesting to me is what is happening at the level of hormones, proteins, enzymes. So I published an article in 2019. This was a little pilot study, um, the small study on eight people designed to provide the kind of pilot study for a larger grant. And we're very interested in cortisol because elevated cortisol has been linked to impaired reduced cognition, mild cognitive impairment. It's a stress hormone. And my colleagues in England, uh, Angela, uh, Angela Smith, 
you have here, sorry, Nina Smith. These are data from her lab showing the cortisol awakening response. So in the morning, as soon as you wake up, if you measure your cortisol, it kind of peaks and then it drops and it drops during the day. If you have Parkinson's disease, your cortisol is significantly elevated and our resistance program reduced. Now, I'm not sure if I will get round to this study, but I'm certainly going to encourage my junior colleagues to now do the full endurance study and asking the question, if we reduce cortisol, can we one, improve cognition and two, possibly improve anxiety? Anxiety is uh, a major component of Parkinson's disease in some people. Working with junior colleague, University of California, San Francisco, who's very interested in clotho. It's an enzyme, it's an anti-aging enzyme, and it's an important anti-aging enzyme. I think those of you who listen to the news today, you know, the life expectancy in the US just dropped a year by about a year and a half. If you're on the south side of Chicago, between blacks and whites, there's a possible difference in life expectancy of about 10 years. So looking after oneself can possibly affect life expectancy. So even though this study is on sprague Dawley rats, I, I think it is uh, informative. So here you have a control group. This is a group with intermittent exercise, another group with continuous exercise. And what you'll see is that their life expectancy has gone up. And I think if you look at places with low life expectancy, there are many, many reasons for this, but lack of easy facilities to exercise could be one. And then over here, you'll see that at the level of the brain and kidney, clotho has gone up. Now, this is a truly amazing paper published in Science in 2020. And it looks at the systemic administration of exercise-induced circulatory blood factors, and they increase BDNF in mice. So the idea here is you have a mouse that exercises, high intensity endurance exercise. You now take the plasma, you now inject it into a sedentary mouse. You then give a behavioral paradigm to the sedentary mouse, and then you look at BDNF, and BDNF has increased. So this run here is actually a sedentary mouse who's had blood injected from a running mouse. Now, why is this important? Because it opens up the idea of getting the benefits of exercising at high intensity when one no longer can. So if you look at people who are really frail, there comes a point when they probably don't have the musculature, et cetera, to exercise at a high intensity. At this point, the idea of various forms of blood transfusion over the next many years could become a reality. And certainly if your CRP needs to be reduced, your BDNF needs to be increased. The idea of being able to do this for the frail elderly, and uh, the frail elderly with Parkinson's disease, I think has a place. Now there's no substitute for the if benefits you get from exercising. This will never replace that. But um, it's a fascinating future. So the bottom line is that genes impact disease. And if you have Parkinson's disease, people are referred for a DAT scan. And what you'll see here is you have reduced dopamine transporter. And here is a healthy brain. And you can see the caudate and putamen are lit up on both sides, bilaterally, caudate, putamen, and what we are hoping is that exercise at some level either preserves this for as long as possible or even slightly improves it. And there's very strong evidence at the level of cortisol, clotho for beneficial changes, IL-6, IL-10, CRP, TNF-alpha, BDNF. So the evidence is quite compelling. So the exercise dose, weight training twice a week, if back size is a fancy statistical way of quantifying an effect over lots of studies, 
An effect size of 0.5 means it's a medium strong effect. Endurance training three times a week, high intensity interval training is very popular. There's no research evidence, but I'm sure it's good. And I think we have at least one person listening who absolutely swears by it. Balanced training is good. Then you have task specific training two times a week for specific deficits. So if you have things you're finding difficult, for example, whether it's eating, an occupational therapist can help. If one freezes with gait, a physical therapist, occupational therapist can help. If one is having trouble organizing oneself cooking and one can't go through all the different parts to cook, one can get people to kind of help one structure that. And when you look at exercise, there really are no detrimental side effects that I can pick up. And so here's what the doctor says to help your Parkinson's disease, take one aspirin every day. Now take that aspirin out for a run, then take it to the gym, and then finally take your aspirin to Tai Chi class. That is the solution. I've been working very closely with the Parkinson Foundation. And for those of you who either help people with Parkinson's disease or have Parkinson's disease, or there are people in the audience who have who both have the disease and help their colleagues. The Parkinson Foundation has produced a very nice document here. It's a consensus document by many experts. I personally am, and I think we have at least two people coming to us from Virginia, totally committed to making exercise available to as many people as possible. So documents like this, maybe not the easiest for everybody to read. So we have simplified this along with the American College of Sports Medicine and the Parkinson Foundation. And this, uh, this page here is much more user friendly. So what is the big question? So the big question is how to get people to exercise. I hope what I've done is to show you that over the last 20 years, probably since 1994, the exercise base is compelling. So it's fine for people to say, I'm not going to exercise. But the point is, the, the evidence is clear. Physical therapy is great. Many institutions like Northwestern, uh, individuals, as soon as they're diagnosed, they're referred to a physical therapist. To get an exercise prescription and then they may go back every six months for a kind of tune-up. Do you need more of this exercise, more of that exercise? Do you need something very specific? Individual training, personal trainers, exercise facilities. We have at least one person who runs an exercise facility, maybe more. They are absolutely terrific. And when you see people going there and the camaraderie are absolutely terrific. And I think my friends in Virginia basically hire a building, hire a room for a building, and then they can bring in groups of people with Parkinson's disease with either no charge or a minimal charge. And I think that is terrific because many of these facilities can cost a lot of money. There are people, uh, certainly my wife included, whose exercise is always done best when she can find some friends to walk with. Um, group training works very well. Rock steady boxing works very well. Not everybody can motivate themselves, but if a friend gives them a call in the morning, come out, please. It works very well. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Danilovich. We work, she works in the area of the frail, frail elderly. And she's perfected the art of training their caregivers to administer exercise interventions and this can be done very cheaply in a very very cost effective way and i think it's great dyad training so if a person has parkinson's disease especially as it develops um there's a stress on the person and there's a stress on the family what some people have done is they recognize that the caregiver also needs to be looked after perhaps almost as much as the person with the disease because they're picking up a considerable uh, load. And there have been programs developed where you have training for the person and you have training for the caregiver. Sometimes they're done separately because one needs a rest, 
from the person that one's looking after all the time. Sometimes they're done together. It all depends on dynamics. Now, okay, I always get the question how to get people to exercise. Well, we live in a different world nowadays. Um, I'm a scientist. I have no recommendations for the four that I list here. My job is just to make people aware. There is wonderful software called Zwift. If you happen to cycle, you can get on uh, your bike indoors. And what I love to do, I love to bike the embankment in London, and it's great. You will get on Strava, there are groups of people with Parkinson's disease running around the world, and they all network with each other, and they show them what they've done. It's very motivating. I looked this up last night, and I thought this was really rather great. There's a lady with Parkinson's disease. She calls herself Twitchy Woman. So you can go and look up Twitchy Woman, and she's got all kinds of ways to help people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, she's terrific. And you can also get onto Facebook, and you'll see that there's a community. This is not an endorsement, but there's a community of people who work with Tonal, which is a resistance producing device. And I happen to be a huge fan of Oscar Wilde, and I think his quote in 1893 for the time in him was right. He also said, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. My guess is if he was around now and he did love himself, he may, he may find a way to motivate himself to exercise with all these available tools. He could even read on his exercise bike, or he could even write his great literature. It's a different world. For those of you who are really serious and understanding the disease and what you can do for yourself, uh, I wrote a large part of the section in chapter 11 on Parkinson's disease. It's just been released, and it is the latest and best evidence for the exercise prescription in some detail. I'm very, very fortunate. Um, my research is funded by the NIH, so I need to put a plug in for them. I'm the PI of a phase three clinical trial. We're now open at nine sites across America. And I'd like you all, I'd like to thank you all very, very much for um, attending this afternoon. It's been an honor and a privilege to talk to you. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, this was tremendous. And uh, I know that we have a number of questions and I will tell you that you must have done a fabulous job, not only to my ears, but to everyone listening because the questions began to shift during your presentation to questions about how much can I do and how much is safe. So I wanna share a question from um, both Karen R in New York and Eric T in Wisconsin. And they were two variants of the same question, which is, is there such a thing as too high or too long a period to be at that 80 to 85% heart rate uh, for getting Parkinson's warriors um, heart rates up above 70% of their max? Um, you know, and, and then the follow-up to that was, is there a dose response effect or a threshold and weekly volume at which there is no additional benefit that we've seen? I take the second one first. Um, I I don't know. Okay, I don't know if there's a threshold effect. Uh, I can tell you that what I do, I listen to my body. So if you're tired and your symptoms are getting worse, you need to cut back. Okay, if you look at that video of Jimmy Choi at the beginning, and Jimmy was much younger at the time. He crossed the line of a hundred mile race in four hours and 50 minutes. He broke the five hours. So one can exercise at quite a high intensity for quite a long time. Whether it gives one any greater bang for the buck, I don't know. The one thing I would recommend is balance. Um, the easiest way to explain balance that I've come up with 
is if one was asked the question, should one eat protein? The answer is yes. Should one eat fat? The answer is yes. Should one eat carbohydrate? The answer is yes. The challenge is to get the right balance. Depending on what you're doing in life, you will flip that percentage. I would not do so much endurance exercise, which can be very addicting. I mean, if you like the bicycle, it's very addicting to be on your bike. But you must not forget the other two. Um, one can overdo it. One can, one can overdo it on the mind. I'm a great believer in taking at least one day a week off. If you are overdoing it, ease back. There's no substitute for talking with a physician once in a while, especially if they understand, you know, exercise and sports medicine. There are getting very smart physicians around the world who understand the exercise prescription very, very well. Um, I hope I've answered your question, but I will be doing, as I mentioned, putting another plug in for this, the Zoom meeting in a week, and then we'll I'll be able to see you all, which I can't at the moment, and then we can talk more specifically because there are big individual differences. And also it depends how long you've been exercising. What I don't want anybody to do is to start off with a bang because it can come back and you get muscle pain and everything else. In my phase three clinical trial, for example, we have eight weeks to build people into doing 80 to 85%. And we start off very, very slowly. And you should always start off slowly. But if you're really getting into it and you want to do more than the four times 30 minutes, which is in SMARTS 2, I do more than four times 30 minutes myself. And I benefit from it, I think. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, so another question, and you just alluded to this a little bit, is, is the incidence and progression of Parkinson's disease different between those with a lifetime of substantial physical of exertion versus someone who has been sedentary with less motor activity? Well, the epidemiology study studies do show that those people who've been more active over their lifestyle have a slightly reduced odds of getting the disease or get the disease slightly later. Now, of course, if one has the disease, that's nice intellectual knowledge, but um, that's all it is. It doesn't help you today. I think regardless of whether it's been a lifelong quote unquote jock to quote Jimmy Choi's uh, words at the opening of the day, or whether one has been completely sedentary. Um, one of the things that I'm very much aware of, of course, amongst the activity levels, is that for females, probably the age of 60 plus, maybe very slightly older, they predate Title IX. Now, Title IX in the US completely changed the access and the way that uh, females and the opportunities women have had to exercise. So um, I'm quite sure there are people, women in their 60s who really haven't and were never exposed to the kind of athletics that males had the opportunity to do. But the evidence is very clear, it's beneficial. You could, I'm not sure I would, but one could make the argument it's even more important for women because resistance exercise is one of the best ways to help osteoporosis, the prevalence and severity of which is greater in females. Thank you. Uh, Will uh, is asking, what effect do Parkinson's drugs have on the beneficial effects of exercise that you've shown during this presentation? Were any of the studies done with people who are taking uh, drugs to uh, treat their Parkinson's um, symptoms? Yeah, the, the drug question is very um, important. So my SPARC study, which I showed, was with people who never have taken drugs. The study which followed, the one by Van der Kolk and the one by Mac, were both with people taking medication. So from my point of view, uh, it's equally good either way. If you're on medication, it's beneficial. If you haven't taken medication, it's beneficial. 
the next generation of studies are going to have to ask, you know, very subtle questions like, are there best times to take medication? And I think for a lot of people, the best time to take medication is before exercise. So you time your peak on period. So not everybody will know this, but the medication response changes over time. When you first go on medication, if you respond well, you have a consistent response that is not time locked to when you take the medication. As you go further and further into the disease and you have wear off periods, you may have 90 minutes where your medication is terrific and you may have 90 minutes where it's less effective. And then timing your exercise within those where, you know, on off periods becomes important. Um, but as a general rule, the, you know, the evidence is clear. Uh, you get exercise benefits whether you take medication or not. One of the things you do find, depending on which study you look at, is if you study people off medication, you may get a bigger beneficial effect of exercise simply because you've now got a larger range. So if a person on medication is 25 and off medication is 50, it's much easier to show a drop in unified Parkinson's disease rating scale from 50 than it is from 25. But that's really it's not an artifact of how it's scored. It's just that off medication, you're more severe. But the take home message applies on meds and off meds equally well. OK, thank you very much. Uh, another question that we're seeing a, a couple different variations of. So the prescription that you gave for um, endurance, resistance, and balance exercise broken down into three different categories. Some folks are wondering about activities that sort of uh, straddle multiple uh, domains. So for instance, does cycling count as a balance exercise if you're on a, um, on a bike as opposed to a uh, stationary bike? Um, you know, are there any other activities such as you know, rock steady boxing or rowing that are maybe full body and, and more bang for the buck? Um, the difference between the two forms of cycling doesn't get at the balance. The bike, when you're out on a bike, gives you balance and propulsion. There's a wonderful video from Bastian Bloom of a person who freezes, jumps on a bike, and he looks like a world-class cyclist. One way to do this is you may do, for example, your endurance for 30, 40 minutes, and then follow it up with a series of balance exercises. I fully understand when you add the prescription up and you look at the number of days in a week, there's a problem, okay? So you can, or before you go on the bike, you can do some balance exercises. You can do a, you know, one hour training where you do some weight training and then cardio of the amount of time. Uh, there are all different ways to pair this. And I think um, we can get into this in much more detail in a week's time because it does become specific part of the issue is how much time you have. Um, my strongest recommendation to anybody with the disease is simply the most important thing of your week is your exercise. It's exactly what I do. Um, I have a job, um, but it never, well, rarely, I mean, every once in a while it does, but my life is structured that it's the exercise first because I think that if I look after myself, I can do my job better. So it actually is part of my job. And if I had, if I did have Parkinson's disease, I would structure my day around my exercise. I understand it's not always possible. I've certainly worked with um, women of childbearing age. And if you have a two-year-old running around the house, I'm not going to tell her to put exercise first, but she gets enough exercise running around after a two-year-old. So you just have to structure it for what works for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is a question here um, from uh, Margarita and let's see, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, oh, and, and Stephen. And the question is, what is the correlation between the benefits of exercise and other diseases such as Alzheimer's and ALS, which I think you've started to, to discuss, but maybe you could expound on just a little. 
exercise is the wonder pill that's wonderful for health and it's wonderful for every disease. I have yet to be told of any disease that doesn't benefit from exercise. So there are diseases, for example, like uh, cancer, and people wonder, why should I exercise with cancer? But I can tell you, when you go through the various forms of therapy and the surgery for cancer, if you have a lot of surgery, you have a lot of muscle wastage. And there are all kinds of studies showing that resistance training, pre-surgery, post-surgery is really good. The chemotherapy can be really quite debilitating. And so um, it's really good for all of them. There is just one very, very slight caveat, and that is, you know, do double, double check if you have a particular disease. So I was reading somewhere that, and I think it's for ALS, that if you're unfortunate enough to have the wrong genetic combination paired with a certain very high intensity exercise, this may not be good, but this is very, very rare. And so if you have a specific disease, then you should consult with your physician because we're getting much better at understanding different genes, how they manifest in the disease. And, but that is a very, very small percentage. And it's a very recent study that I read about. And I certainly would not use that in any way to take a message that exercise may not be good for me. But if you have a disease other than Parkinson's disease, certainly consult with uh, a gifted physician and a gifted exercise professional. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm aware that it is five o'clock right now and Dr. Korkos has been um, so gracious as to say that he will continue taking questions past our 5 p.m. stop time. But I know that if anybody um, has another commitment, uh, small children, anything else that's calling for your attention, please feel free. Um, it, to, to leave as you need to. Um, I will also say, um, Dr. Korkos had mentioned that next week we will have a session where you will be able to ask questions uh, live. He will be able to interact with you and see you. We will be sending more information about that in the follow-up to today's program. So uh, don't feel as though you've missed anything. Uh, that will be in the follow-up email. Um, another question here, Dr. Korkos is, do we have any sense from the research whether exercise in Parkinson's disease is disease modifying or only symptom modifying? Well, that is what SPARKS3 is designed to show, okay? The, since 1987, no drug study has shown disease modification. If I can show a difference between 60 to 65% and 80 to 85%. We will interpret that as evidence that the disease has been modified, that the progression of the disease has been slowed. I think we have a good chance to show that. The study was designed to show it. It's been powered to show it. We have a phase two clinical trial leading in to a phase three clinical trial. You can read the phase two study. I don't know who asked the question. Um, what I'm saying next is a little complicated. The phase two study was what is called a futility study. And in that study, we demonstrated that high intensity exercise is not futile to study with, the, with respect to the question of modifying disease progression. But we did not demonstrate efficacy. We need the phase three clinical trial to do that. But if I had the disease, I would interpret the phase two study as evidence for modifying the disease. I'm acutely aware that one can pick holes with that argument. And so I want to kind of straddle that fine line between making it clear that the study was designed to inform a phase three study. The issue is the results won't be out for four or five years. And so the question then is, do you interpret that study as uh, being able to slow down progression? I do. Thank you. Do you have time for a few more? Yes, no, I've, I've, I've got as much time as you have energy, Vic. 
Very good. Well, then uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I have a great question here uh, from one of our MD alums. Uh, and he is asking, when adults do progressive exercises year after year, let's say there's someone um, who is a fitness buff, um, those exercises over time become less progressive as, uh, let's say, as you age. Um, you're, you're maybe in a point where you're maintaining fitness as opposed to continuing to reach new milestones. What does, how do you prescribe exercise for patients for whom that may be true? Well, that gets really quite difficult. So the uh, physician is exactly correct. So when you take a deconditioned person and you start out on a progressive resistance uh, program, they're going to reach a point when they plateau. And then what is really good is to find exercise professionals who can then teach you another set of exercises to do. So maybe you'll do 16 weeks of one set of exercises. You'll reach that plateau. You'll then change, come back to those exercises and go up to another plateau. But we're also dealing with age and disease. So at some level, just holding constant is terrific. So for those of you my age, which happens to be 67, if you were asked the question, would you keep what you've got now at 77 and 87 and 97, I think most of you would say for sure. So um, exercise physiologists, exercise professionals can help you reach a plateau. And then when you stabilize, show you ways to hit another plateau. And then one can also change one's routine throughout the year because you don't want to be doing the same thing. It can get very boring and the body deals best with adaptation. So there are ways, there are certainly books, there's a whole field of study around this. And so the idea is to get oneself into really good shape, the shape that one's comfortable with, and at that point, the progressive resistance part probably becomes a misnomer because just holding it or declining very little is where you go. So I gave up a long time ago trying to do too well in the weight room. It just doesn't work. Uh, oh, switch gears here. Is there any benefit to golf for Parkinson's disease? The, the questioner is probably hoping that the answer is yes. Well, I mean, the answer is yes. So we can finish there. But now you can ask yourself the question, how much benefit? So, um, so imagine you go out to a golf course and you've got one of those little scooters and you basically scoot around and you get off it just to swing. So you've done, uh, I'm sure the person who's asking the question is off par. So they're going to have 72 swings, and that's good for you. I mean, it's a dynamic neuromuscular exercise. Now, if you actually walk the course, and if you carry your clubs around the course, then I think it gets better and better for you. I mean, it's basically a good walking exercise. Also, there's an immense amount of work coming out of England on the idea of being in a green environment is very, very helpful. So the idea of being out on a golf course, just in terms of the green environment, the nature, I think it is very good. Now you've got to um, see whether you can make it as kind of vigorous as you can. And then you can ask yourself, well, what can I do to make myself a better golfer? Well, if you want the big swing, a little bit of progressive resistance exercise may help you. So if you look at some of the elite golfers nowadays, they're terrific athletes. They're absolutely terrific athletes. And you can be 100% sure that they're working very, very hard. And you can be 100% sure that when Tiger Woods won, I think two years ago, he had worked unbelievably hard to get in shape to do what he did. Thank you. 
there's a question here about a graduate from the class of 1989, uh, the MD program, who lives in rural Canada and has a question about how to participate or learn about um, your studies. And I think maybe we'll go broader and say, how can an individual learn more about um, clinical trials or other studies that they may be eligible for? Um, that's a really good question. Maybe you can come back with more detail and ask me personally in a week's time and walk me through it. I'm a big fan of Canada. We have a site in Alberta. We also have a site on the East Coast, at Wilfrid Laurier. Those two universities have world, world famous specialists in Parkinson's disease at Alberta Wilfrid Laurier. I'm not exactly sure where you are in Canada, but nowadays, nowadays Zoom has meant that you can basically learn anything, anywhere. It's just a question of finding somebody and get on the line and Zoom. And so whether one's in Canada, we have people in Holland, really makes very little difference. But you know, I'm certainly happy to help you in uh, in a week's time if you can give me more detail. Okay, fantastic. Uh, there's a question here about um, does the precision of activity uh, the oh this is a good one the centrality of proprioception um, does that give more value than raw muscle activity or is it the activity itself that is most important? Now that is a very, very clever question. So my 10th most cited paper, and I only published it in, 20, in 2009, was a review on proprioceptive abnormalities in Parkinson's disease. So it's not something that's often talked about because the deficits are not striking on clinical examination. So there are many other diseases which have much bigger proprioceptive abnormalities, but I think proprioception is very, very important. I think it's the reason why the instability training works so very well, because when you are, when you have two devices making you unstable, your body is moving, you're stretching muscles, you're stretching spindles, you're putting tension on Golgi tendon organs, and all this information is going into S1 and S2 of the brain. And then this in information is being integrated and then probably fed forward to motor cortex, which is issuing the commands. And I think it is very, very important. And the other thing is that people are inventing all the time devices to capitalize on proprioception. So for example, if you uh, freeze there are devices, there are vibrating soles to shoes. Some people put a little device on the posterior part of the ankle. And at the point when a person freezes, they just get a teeny little shock. I mean, it's, it's not painful in any way. It's just a stimulus, which can then get fed up to the brain. And so I think um, activities that capitalize on working proprioception are going to be very, very good. And not, this is not proprioception per se, but rigidity um, is certainly linked to abnormal muscle responses. And rigidity is a big deal in Parkinson's disease. And one of the things that we have not yet been able to do is to take our exercise regimens and to fine tune them to ask the question, what is best for tremor? What is best for bradykinesia? What is best for abnormal postural reflexes? And what is best for rigidity? So those are the so-called four cardinal motor signs and future research needs to really dissect because as those of you who have the disease and see your friends and colleagues who have the disease, some people are very tremor dominant but are not that slow. And that's one variant of the disease and others are akinetic, bradykinetic, rigid. And that's another variant of the disease. And what works best for one variant may not necessarily work best for the other. And so we're now getting very, very much into the domain of personalized medicine. And if anybody's really interested, 
Uh, I'm giving a keynote presentation in September to the Movement Disorders Society, and I'm laying out the exercise prescription, and my good friend Alice Nieboyer is making the case, which I agree with, that one size does not fit all. And so she's going to walk through very specific examples about if one has freezing of the gait, if one has problems turning, if one has problems walking and talking, what are the ways that we can adapt to our treatment? And so the next generation of interventions are going to target a specific. That's a very long winded answer to the question about proprioception, but it is, it is fundamental. And if you're doing activities which target proprioception, I can only think that is a good idea. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Jack that asks, given the cortisol curve, is there an optimal time for exercise? Oh, I think I know Jack, and I think Jack always asks me questions that I can't answer. Um, next time, perhaps we'll have to filter out Jack, though. I'm only, only joking, Jack. That's a very clever question. Um, I have no idea. I'm going to have to think about that. Um, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is just to listen to one's body. There are some people who do really well in the morning. There's some people who do really well in the afternoon. There's some people who do really well in the evening. I actually do well at different times of day, depending on what I'm doing. So at the moment, I can cycle early in the morning. I can be on my bike at 5.30 and have no trouble. Uh, I would struggle to do well in the gym with weights and other exercises. I like to be up for two or three hours and really, really wake up. Um, maybe activity dependent. Um, I don't know. Um, and that would be very, very hard research to do. Very hard. Thank you. O is asking, is the idea to increase the duration or the intensity in getting up to an 80 to 85 percent heart rate? Well, the research is five minutes warm up, 30 minutes at 80 to 85 percent, and then five minutes cool down. The key thing that I think there is that it should be 80 to 85 percent and it should be for 30 minutes. If you can do 40 minutes, I'm not sure it'll do you any better, and I don't think it'll do you any harm, um, but the publication, and it's very similar across the three publications I showed you. And the key, the key take home message is that the intensity matters, okay? There is something about working out at 80 to 85%, and it may be related to oxygenating the blood vessels. And that really what you wanna do is to increase the oxygenation to the brain because it's from the blood vessels in the brain that the neurons get the oxygen to function well. Um, but that's what the current prescription is. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions here about specific medications, and I think I'll, I'll defer those to next week. But one of these questions is interesting. Uh, well, they're all interesting, but this one in particular, um, it's come from a couple of people who, who mentioned that they take medication that influence their pulse rate, uh, maybe a beta blocker. How do they determine what their maximum heart rate would be so that they can reach that 80 to 85% maximum? That may be a difficult question, I'm sorry. No, no, it's not a difficult question. I mean, it's a really, really good question. So people are on beta blockers. Um, if you're on a beta blocker, um, you know, certainly do check with your physician. I don't want anybody to do anything which is not physician approved. Um, but certainly one thing which I would recommend to everybody if they can have done is that you go to an exercise physiology lab. Departments of cardiology have this. They're quite expensive, but it may well be covered by your insurance. Alternatively, you can go to an exercise facility where, it's, uh, where it is cheaper 
and you simply have what is called a graduated stress test. And what you will do is you will walk on an inclined treadmill until you've gone as hard as you can. And that will give you your maximal heart rate. And that's the heart rate to use. Okay, because you can't actually go higher than that. It just, it is less than uh, if you weren't on the beta blocker, but that's the way it is. Um, and now it is a really deep question whether one gets the same benefit on the beta blocker than if one was off the beta blocker. And that we don't know, okay? And this raises a really kind of a complicated question here. So if you look at the, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the maximum heart rate published in my Sparks 3 paper in 2018, that was very, very close to the maximal heart rate of age match controls. It's very close to the maximal heart rate you can get from formulae to predict. The formulae are not that accurate, but if you use them, my heart rates were about there. There's also a paper in 2016 by Kanagusu, a Brazilian group, and they talk about a blunted heart rate response. And there is a group of people with Parkinson's disease who will have a blunted heart rate response, which may not be caused by beta blockers. And so if one has access to the facilities to get a good medical input, so one really knows what one's heart rate maximum is, is a good thing. So normally how one does one's heart rate maximum is one finds an activity and then one does it until one's heart is beating as fast as one can. So one will be on a treadmill and one will be walking and walking until you just have to stop. And that gives you the maximum heart rate. Um, quick way to kind of guesstimate what it should be. It's 220 minus your age. So if your age is 70, then your heart rate would be about 150. But there's huge variability there. And at some point, um, there's no substitute from getting best medical help. I'm happy to go into this in more detail uh, in a week's time. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't want anybody to do anything and then find that it causes them harm. Um, I've had two graduated stress tests, and I'm very glad that I had them. And it gives me a certain confidence that I can push my heart quite hard. Okay, there was a specific question about um, Exer Gaming software. You had mentioned it. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about what may be available or anything that you've seen that you particularly think works well for individuals living with Parkinson's? Well, that's a good question. I don't know at the moment. I think it's proprietary to my good friend, Bastian Bloom, but he's a really nice guy. So um, maybe maybe Vic or if a vet is around or Judy, maybe somebody could take a note and email that to me. Uh, Bastian is a very nice person, absolutely passionate about exercise. And maybe he can make some of the gaming software available. And, you know, I think there's no question that some people just find exercise kind of boring and you know, if you can play Pac-Man or whatever game is out there, um, it can be very, very helpful. Certainly have a look at Zwift if you like, you know, depending on what your activity is. There's some wonderful rides there. Again, I'm not advocating Zwift per se. I'm just saying whatever works for you. Well, and I know that a lot of the individuals on today's call work with um, or are training individuals living with Parkinson's. So I've seen a wide range of activities that they are asking about um, in terms of benefit, but uh, one that's particularly, uh, two, well, two that are particularly interesting. There's one question about hippotherapy, so horseback riding for patients with Parkinson's. And the other is from uh, Lauren at Juilliard, it looks like. 
And she asked if you've observed the movement work that Alexander Technique teachers are doing with people with Parkinson's. So I thought those might be interesting for people to hear about. I haven't. So um, I, I can tell you that hippotherapy, it works very, very well. Um, certainly very much aware of the work that has been done in cerebral palsy with hippotherapy. Uh, again, just being outside in nature, I think is terrific. Um, so I want to be very clear what my position is. I love all forms of activity. And certainly if one is on a horse and you kind of see how hard one can work on a horse, you know, it is a really good workout. Um, the kind of studies I do are where we can control things like the weight moved or the stress or load put on the heart. And these other studies, so I'm a huge fan of rock steady boxing. Uh, I had in, only had a short presentation today. My favorite Parkinson's slide is on a group of people in rock steady boxing, and it is absolutely terrific. And dance is terrific. And I think we have hopefully at least one person who's interested in rock climbing. Um, I may have a student starting at Northwestern in the fall, and she's passionate about rock climbing. Um, they're all great. Um, at the end of the day, they're not all going to be studied. The ones that are going to be studied are those that you can exert a modicum of scientific control over, and also they have a real biological basis. So, you know, one of the reasons endurance exercise is so popular, let me back up one. When one gets a phase three clinical trial, one has to outline for the scientific panel that reviews it, the biological basis. And it turns out that animals like rats and primates can do certain kinds of activities, but not others. So running on a wheel is very, very easy to get that kind of data. So there is a kind of an inherent unintentional bias here and that activities which get studied are the ones which can be studied. But the other activities I think are really good. But you know, the important thing to do is if the hippotherapy is working great and the Alexander technique is working great, but you've got no evidence that whilst doing it, the heart rate is being elevated and you've really got no theoretical basis to believe that it will delay disease progression. It may be wonderful for anxiety, depression. It may attenuate anxiety, and that may suppress some of the signs of the disease. So it may work wonderfully well at the level of keeping symptoms under check. But there's going to be no rationale. So, you know, at some point, the question one could ask is how much Alexander technique or how much hippotherapy is it good to do in a week? And is there room for anything else? It comes back to my kind of diet argument. So maybe we will assume that both of those techniques are just like protein. They're just great for you. But if you're on an all protein diet, maybe that's not best for you. Very good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, um, for your time and uh, for everyone for attending. We'll be sending up a follow-up email that will include Daniel's presentation and the recording for uh, today's session, as well as information about the follow-up session next week for anyone who is interested and may have additional questions that we were not able to answer today. Um, on behalf of Northwestern and the Medical Alumni Association, thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees. I hope everyone has a pleasant evening and uh, best wishes for um, your health and well being. Thank you.